and welcome to this new podcast which I'm doing, which is a bit of a rally review. Uh, and this week it's going to be on the Northwest Stages, which has just been. And we very uh, kindly got Chris Ingram with us. So, Chris Ingram, welcome for this uh, Northwest Stages rally review. Thanks, mate. Good to be here and looking forward to discuss it with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was uh, some event, and you probably. <laughs> You couldn't have asked for a better start to your British Championship campaign and uh, just get the season off, you know, on a high. How was it? Yeah, it was It was amazing. It was a really challenging rally, as it was two years ago in the dry, but I think the wet conditions made it even trickier and it was, it was carnage out there. But yeah, for, for us being first on the road, it was quite, um, yeah, the best place to be. Mm. Um, and I had I had a clean rally, not really any moments. A few maybe not quite the right tire choice on the afternoon loop when it rained, but um, all in all, just a really good clean rally from us, and delighted to get that win and start off strong. Mm, yeah, you definitely did start off strong, and then obviously we're talking about like the conditions of the weekend. Like I think everyone was following it, and we seen that. It was pretty hectic conditions. Um, like, with you being first on the road, obviously that gave quite a big advantage. And, like, I was watching, like, your stage times and how you went. It seemed that the first two, you probably went for a bit of a push. And then after that, it, the sensible head came on. And then it was kind of like just managing that lead. I suppose that, you know, you knew that being first on the road, you had the best conditions and they were just going to falter. Like, do you think there was any way that they were going to that they could have got you, to be honest, after you opened up that initial lead? Um, I think we were quite lucky in a way in the afternoon because we went out on slicks and it started raining. And um, that could have gone <laughs> terribly wrong. We could have thrown it away. But uh, when Oshin Price retired, that was, that was a shame for him. But then we had quite a big lead to William and then it was just about getting through. Um. But yeah, I think it was just a bit distracting with the cancel stages in, in, in the morning. We were, yeah, like we were really strong in the first two. Then the third one, I had a spin, which you might have seen. Mm. Um, but we didn't, we, we, I think we only lost about one, one and a half seconds to the fastest time. Um, and then the next two stages were stages alike, but they got cancelled. Then there was just a lot of, rumours about times being cancelled and all sorts so it mm. was a bit distracting but um I think you know we did well to just keep keep in control and get it through and just to get the wins the main thing isn't it yeah and do but you feel quite comfortable were, then really in good. in in that rally because is the northwest stages your home event being from Manchester would is that what you would call your home event yeah, I, I would. I mean, it's still like an hour from where I'm from. Mm. Like the Cambrian's probably just as close, but that's in Wales. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having done it a few years ago, and you know, it's I guess it is my home event. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, yeah, having having done a rally, it's always more comfortable going into it, isn't it? Yeah. Did you have like pace notes left over from? From the other year when you did it, is it once or twice you've done it before? Just, just once, yeah, and right. half of more than half the rally was the same. So yeah, we did use those notes, and they were spot on. Really, we barely changed anything in, in the recce. Oh really? Yeah, so that that was a good advantage. How is your is your pace notes like? If if you now settled into the pace notes that you use, and that and that's pretty much it. Or you, st you know, over the years, you still kind of, I mean, you'll always adjust little bits, but is yeah. the basis of your pace notes the same? Yeah, exactly. Um, the angles and stuff for me, the, the, they've been the same for the last several years. It's just tweaking them to get the flow better. Mm. If anything, there was way too much information in the notes. And over the last year or so, I've simplified them up a lot. Mm -hmm. But because I've listened to them before and knew they worked, I didn't 
I didn't uh, bother to change them that much for this event. But yeah, if you listen to my onboard, you'll you'll, you'll notice Alex was having to <laughs> bloody yeah, he was having to be well on the ball to get all that out in time. Yeah, yeah. I uh, know it's um, certainly certainly some some tricky conditions and stuff. So you say you got you got caught out on on slick. So was was that obviously? When was the chance that you got to change those, or like how badly did that affect you in the afternoon? Yeah, so there was only one midday service, and it got cut in half because of that. Basically, the organisers trying to get the rally back on track, so they made the right call. But we didn't even have tyres ready until the last moment. We yeah. didn't have ch- chance to make a a solid call. I didn't get any. Even though I had so many mates and family up on the stage, I didn't get any information <laughs> that it was wet. Calling in all the favours, were you? <laughs> yeah, it was just all a bit frantic. Yeah. Um. But look, luckily, we got away with it. Really. Yeah. The organisers obviously had a big job to do, and yeah, you know, with the 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 cards that they were dealt, I think they had done quite an incredible job to keep it. Yeah. Going. They could have easily have canned the whole thing. They were losing, they were hemorrhaging time. You know, after the couple of stages getting blocked and then there was, you know, the issue with a, you know, a tractor or, or potential yeah. tractor or whatever it was, you know, they did some job to to get it to the end. Did And they shortened the, the intervals, I believe it or not, did they? Was Did it go from minutes to 30 seconds? Yeah, and that was a amazing idea just mm. to make, make sure that everyone got through every stage in that last loop but yeah I think they did an amazing job to to turn it round despite those challenges and you know it's not their fault that people are going off and blocking the road is it oh absolutely not no 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 I, there's no way that you can that you can blame the organizers for you know for for things like that happening I wonder like how how did they manage to put that through and change because you would think that you would have to Prearrange like thirty second intervals or minute intervals. That's all like approved with, I don't know, insurance and organisers and stuff. Like, I wonder how they I'm actually sure. to make that work. I'm not sure, but maybe they already had the option mm. you know, in the back pocket just in case. But you know, for safety, minute a minute's always better, isn't it? But when you force to like that, I I, I guess and guessing that they they already had it as a last resort. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was it was good on them. I did um I did a podcast before, um with Richard uh, Crozier, the clerk of the course for the Mull Rally, and we we're yeah. talking about the opening up of different stages and stuff, and like the adjustments of uh, bogey times. Have you seen differences in like the northwest stages and stuff? Was there like less was there less chicanes or like more faster bits? Do you think, or did you, or is there like is there any talks of this? You know the virtual chicanes. Um, there, there was no Turks of virtual chicanes. I've personally never come across that yet. Um, there was there was some places where they added a chicane, like in a dangerous spot. Mm. Some places where they took chicanes away from last time. Um, I don't I don't understand the, the bogey rule. To be honest, yeah, I've never I've never really um, yeah, I've not. I've not really come across it why why it needs to be in place or whatever, but yeah, what is what's the is is that still a thing in in UK rallying? I mean, as far as as far as I'm aware, like after the conversation I had with Richard, the basically, you know, the average speed across the whole stage can only be, you know, a maximum of a of a certain speed, let's say seventy five or eighty mile an hour or whatever it is, and as far as I'd grasped from him. They've increased that that average speed, right? Which means that they don't have to put in chicanes in fast sections to reduce the car's overall average speed over a stage. And I believe yeah. it's probably for insurance purposes. So on the likes of the Mull Rally and on lots of the very very fast bits, there'll be a chicane right in the middle of it just to really kill the pace of it. Like from yeah. a safety perspective, I don't know. Like, what actual difference is it going to make? Because you're still going to be on that fast bit until you come up to a chicane and then you're going to speed up and up to potentially top speed and going to continue on. So I don't know. It sounds like they've changed it for the better anyway. So that's all I'm happy about. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, I, there's some fa- fl- flat out places where you're on the limited for ages, but it's actually fine. It's not yeah. dangerous. But then there's some like really bad dips and bumps where there's, there's there's a famous place now where there's been really bad crashes on the northwest. This bad yeah. dip every year, like there's been a few cars written off, and I think places like that they should probably be something, you know, that's like a renowned spot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because we want to like save folks' homework. cars, don't we? Like we, it's not nice seeing folk damaging their cars, and especially like. Folk that have done the events and understand understand the financial struggles. Like, yeah, I remember yeah. like being younger and spectating, and you'd be like, you're out looking for crashes and stuff. And then as soon as you mature up a bit or you get into the scene, you're like, oh my god! <laughs> yeah. If you see any stones in the road, you're like at the side of the road, like flagging them down, like slow down, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, totally agree. But it's it's you. It's always on bumps, isn't it, or shiny tarmac? Yeah. Talking about like bumps and stuff. What is the profile of the Northwest stages and how how did you set up or what adjustments would you have made to your car, which was the Polo? So so last time I did it was in the Tox Sport Skoda in like European tarmac spec. And it was so stiff and so twitchy. Yeah. Like I was having big moments, not even pushing too hard, but it was just that twitchy. But Melvin Evans Polo is so well set up to you know, UK and Irish roads. Yeah. It was just so much more forgiving and easy to drive. Just a bit softer and more more compliant on the bumps. Mm. Yeah, it was it was so well set up and just gave me so much confidence on those roads. Mm. And was there it a shakedown so bumpy. before it? Say again, mate. Was there a shakedown before the event? Yeah, we did um a quick shakedown on a, a private road nearby. Right. Which was a great test because it was quite a greasy road and yeah, it couldn't have been a better little shakedown really. And what um what would you have been doing with the setup? Like, you know, back when it was, you know, kind of in the in the R two and stuff and kind of like rallying al- alongside like John Armstrong and that, like I, I was kinda of learning from him like to go as aggressive as you can get away with, as stiff as you can get away with and then bring it back a little bit. Like, yeah. What sort of things were you doing? Is it you know like what adjustments did you make? Would you have been softening up the rebound a little bit or something to actually to to absorb those bumps, or did was you pretty much just arrive and drive? Yeah, I actually did go a bit stiffer from a, a little bit stiffer on the the front roll bar, um, and a few a few clicks on the front just because I like a really precise front. Right. Okay. Um. But then when it was wet, I wanted to go back the other way because you always, you know, the, the stiffer the car and the wet, you, you're just going to lose confidence. You need to get that feel and you need to get that weight transfer under braking. Mm. So um, it worked in the morning, but then in when it started raining, I, I wanted to do a load of clicks, but we were running out of time. And yeah, we just had to sort of get through. And yeah, we we were still sort of, we still set a few fastest times and we were, we were doing enough. So we just kept, kept yeah. it as it was. Yeah. You didn't need to take any risks or anything. Yeah, exactly. And the events quite, you know, the event mileage or what, what you did, would you, would you say obviously in a kind of one day event, it's more of like a, like a sprint compared to the rallies that you're used to. Like, would you have been carrying just one spare wheel, for example? Yeah, we were mate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, it was um, a bit of a different mindset because going into that first stage, I was thinking, right, these some of these boys have just been out on West Cork for three days, 300 kilometres, you know, WRC event length. I've got to be absolutely on it now on the first stage to to get to that level. Yeah. Because I'm not going to have a couple of days to catch up. Mm, so yeah. That was my mindset, really. Um, and yeah, we just pulled a really good lead. Yeah, but did then you expect that anything Chris? can did happen, you... can't it? In the day, did you expect to pull that lead from the start? No, not that much. Oh, I right. was hoping it would be a couple of seconds. Yeah, 
Um, but we didn't we didn't actually get any times until just before the third stage. Oh, right. So going into that second stage is a bit weird because I was we didn't know where we were at. Yeah. So it was still a bit tense. You know how you're nervous going into the first stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that feeling just carried on through to the end of the second stage and all along that road section because there was no phone signal. There was nothing. And then the first text that, I, that came through was just before the start of stage three. It was Nicky Grist. Yeah. And he sent me a message saying, like, fair play or something. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I thought, all right, we must be doing all right then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then so that was a bit bit of a relief, actually. So, are you going to be using the the polo, or you know, is it going to be a two a two car Yaris Yaris team that that you will be uh, using? Like, are you going to be in a Yaris? We're going to be moving to a Yaris as soon as possible, as soon as the second car is built. Oh, is it just not built yet? Is that is, is that the issue? No, so so Marion's car is. I think it's only like the fifth, sixth car that they've built. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Yeah. Um. But obviously, it was always the plan for for Marion to get the first car. Yeah. Um. And then I, you know, did my deal with the team, and it was all agreed that yeah, we can start with the polo, and then as soon as the second car is available, then we'll both be in the Yaris. So, um. I'm looking forward to trying it, but the, the, you know the Polo's still a great car as well. So mm. I think we're in a good, we're in a good position, really, because I think yeah the Yaris is showing really good speed, but the Polo's still such a great car, isn't it? Yeah, and you'll be well used to that. You'll you'll just fit in there like a glove. You'll just feel a part of that car. I do, I do on tarmac for sure. I've not driven it on gravel yet, but yeah, I'm sure it'll be. Awesome on gravel as well. Yeah, and he's looked incredible as well with the you know the Castrol sponsorship really going back to the the grassroots of it all. That's fantastic. Like, is is that all one deal? Is is it like Castrol and the Yaris? Is that all like clubbed together? Or is that two separate kind of deals? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the main um, the main incentive was. For Castrol to be on the Toyota, uh, you know, to to reignite that that past link, yeah. Um, and there's obviously stuff going on behind the scenes commercially with within that, I I believe. Mm. Um, and this is, I think it's a really good opportunity for for Castrol to, you know, be on be on the car, and hopefully we'll both be keeping up results like that through the season mm. yeah I mean they must have been happy there was there there, there would have been represent representatives at that rally I would have assumed was there and were they like chatting to you and pretty happy with how things were going they couldn't make it because there's um I think it was motor GP in Portugal or something mm, right. but um yeah, I don't follow I don't follow the bikes much. But there was um a few guys from Toyota. Right, okay. At the rally, which was pretty cool and you know, exciting to have them there. Yeah. I oh, know that's fantastic. And you know, getting getting in with their kind of you know, the manufacturer and you know, getting the name in there, making the contacts as well. It's all about contacts these days, really, isn't it? It's about who you've got in your phone book and who you can give a quick call and you know who you've got a rapport with. If it's a if it's a friendly face or somebody they know, then you know it certainly opens doors, doesn't it? Yeah, that's mate. You've that's exactly it, and I think I've learned that so much over the last few years that it really is all about who you know and who you get on with, and not. I guess it is kind of politics as well. Yeah, but that's probably just as important as pure speed and talent and results if not more yeah yeah definitely well, I, I need to i need to get on top of my politics <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well so obviously this is a fantastic start and this is the start of your british british rally championship campaign 
how have you found the the competition? I mean, obviously we spoke about it. it's been a great weekend, but there was, you know, I had a look. There was up to you know twenty eight, twenty nine retirements, and you know there's lots of quick lads that that didn't get to the end and stuff. You know, Oshin and a few other names. Like, how how looking forward with things? What's your expectations? And are you feeling optimistic? Are you quite happy with how things are going? Or, you know, obviously the aim is to win the championship, but, you know, what's the competition looking like? The competition's amazing, and that's why it's so exciting this year, I think. it You know, four Mo turned up last year, and I, I, get, I think he sort of scared people off. <laughs> and he didn't really have any competition, you know, consistently. Yeah. So he, he got, for, for me, he, he, he had it handed to him, really. Yeah. But it's a shame he's not doing it this year, because I like to think I'd give him a good go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this year... Keep this, him honest. Yeah, definitely. Like, we did in Ypres, so yeah. we definitely could in the UK. But, um, yeah, there's so many quick guys, and that's just brilliant to be a part of, because... You know, I'd love, I'd love to get my name on that trophy, and winning it against those guys would make it so much more meaningful. Yeah, definitely. But I like what um your question was: what's my my plan really? And I think it's just to carry on like that in the northwest. Mm, yeah. And you know, now I want to show it in Wales. I want to show it in Scotland, not just um on the northwest. And. So obviously, looking at the the bigger picture, if you, I mean, obviously your name is well known around the UK and Britain. But when you're doing these rallies closer to home and you're building up these connections, is this going to be, you know, a good chance to look for potential sponsors? You know, are, are you going to be, you know, you know, pushing for that so that you can open up a, you know, a proper you know, WRC campaign in the future? You know, is, is there, you know, British companies and stuff that can potentially get on board with you? Yeah, that's that was the whole um, idea behind coming back to the BRC because we've not seen it yet, but, you know, it's great news that ITV are covering it. Mm, yeah. Which is next Tuesday, I believe. Um, and that, that's going to be such a great boost. And I just, at the moment, I just don't see the return on investment in WRC in yeah. the UK for UK companies. I just think they need to do a much better job. Yeah. Um, and for me, there's so, there's so much more value in doing BRC this year, which sounds bizarre to say, but it, I think it's pretty true. Yeah. Um, and... You know, even like bringing sponsors to events as well as the coverage. There's so many things you can do and so many opportunities. Um, I hope that WRC sorts itself out in the next year or two. And, you know, I'll be keeping my powder dry, really. And I'm coming up with a plan on how I can be back there mm. much stronger. Um, hopefully when Rally 2 or Rally 2 Plus is the top class, because I... It's a no-brainer that that's the way it needs to go. When you've got you've got fifty cars doing the northwest stages in Rally Two, but you've yeah. only got twelve cars doing um, Croatia in yeah. Rally Two or whatever it is. It's yeah, it's something's got to change, hasn't it? Yeah. So would you say that as far as the WRCs? promotion is concerned they're potentially not getting that quite right at the moment i think the promotion's great but it's just the right people aren't seeing it, it it's too much directed at just hardcore rally fans right which, okay yeah. as hardcore rally fans it's, it's great but we need to get the sport out there to a wider audience yeah yeah get it all over the telly and get it on there you know, rather than pestering about with the the kind of rally app on on the phone, you know, and yeah, it's got to be free to watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it, it it's it certainly, it certainly is. And you were talking about like the rally two plus and kind of these different 
uh, kind of classes. Do you think that'll dilute it down a wee bit? Do you think? I think there just needs to be one top class, but that's more affordable. Yeah. You know, if if you said to me now that Rally Two was going to be the top class, then I'd be break. I'd be breaking my balls to try and find the budget to do WRC to. Yeah. You know, and and I'm sure that several other guys in every European country would. Yeah. 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 You know the the several top guys from each country would be wanting to show themselves in WRC if they had the chance, wouldn't they? Oh, absolutely, yeah. But now it's just so ridiculously expensive. Yeah. And it's so unreachable. Even WRC two is the costs of like almost doubled in the last five years. Really? And and the RC for that for that fact, yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. And what's caused that? Is it just the prices of everything? You know, inflation and after COVID and everything, it's just hiked everything up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And even, you know, the length, like Monty, you're there for 10 days. Yeah. But your lads, you know, your, your mechanics and stuff, they're sat in service most of the time. You know, we've got one or two services in a day. Yeah. But they're there all, all week. It's, all it's all things like that that just adds up. Yeah. And the cost of running the cars and the tires, the tires is ridiculous. Mm, yeah. That everyone has to pay full price for a control tire. Whereas this year in the BRC, if I win a rally, I get all my tires for free and more. What for that event or for the next with event? my with with Michelin, yeah. So you know, if I won every event this year, I'd be selling tires. <laughs> but really? in the in WRC, really I'd be, I'd be um, paying, having to find 15, 20 grand a rally, which is just outrageous, isn't it? Yeah. Women hell. And then, jeez, oh, the cost, they're just, it's just scary, isn't it? I mean, like, to put what, it, what the, the, easiest, the, cost? the easiest way um, to put it in perspective is Monte Carlo cost me the same price as the, the full BRC will cost me this year. You and the car to... broke down and I got absolutely nothing from it apart from an amazing launch I did with, with my sponsors. Yeah. Wow. That is mental. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, if it, BRC carries on like this, it'll be the best year's rally and I'll have for a long time. And I'm... Yeah. Already really enjoying it. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to push on there. Like, you know, when kind of Craig Breen kind of came back and did his, you know, Irish Tarmac Championship and kind of went back to grassroots and it, it really filled him with with fire. Like, is that something that you think you need or that you're going to get from this? Definitely, mate, yeah. Like, I was having to work so hard to find the funds to do a WRC event. You know, literally, I worked on Monty all of last year mm. to pull that budget together. And then it was just soul-destroying. Yeah. The car breaking down. Um, yeah, it was gutting. And you just think, oh, my God. Yeah. The amount of effort that's gone into that. And I didn't even enjoy a single second of it because we we were having issues, but already the one day, you know, it was the same, same when I did the Northwest stages two years ago, I just enjoyed it so much. Yeah. And like the RAC with the TR7, I, it was just unbelievable. It was so much fun. Yeah. You look like you were loving that. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's this, this, I guess it's the stress and the pressure of finding the funds for WRC as a privateer, it's it's almost impossible to make it work at the moment. Yeah. There's so much. Yeah. Just mental. And there's so much work, not even the funding, but there's so much prep and yeah, it's um it's so hard. Yeah. Well, I would like to cover a bit more of that and um if you're up for it, obviously, I know we spoke about this before, but we'll keep this to kind of a bit of a, like a Northwest Stages rally review or BRC rally review. And uh, 
yeah, a bit later on in the week, we'll maybe do a bit more of a proper off the track podcast style and get to get to know you a bit deeper and see what Chris is like off the track. Um, but yeah, before we kind of shoot off, I, I was we we spoke before, and it's something I found really interesting. For the people listening and watching, we, we spoke about the, the different restrictors and the R5s and the Rally 2s. Um, you know, would you mind just explaining that for the, for the, for the people watching? Yes, yeah, so um, the FIA spec Rally 2 car, is it, it's 32mm um, restrictor. Um, but in the, the national championships, you're allowed to run a 34 so mm-hmm. I think I don't know exactly, but is it an extra thirty horsepower? Mm. Which on you know, like on a dry tarmac road, it's uh it's a hell of a difference really. It's like DRS, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um yeah, like last like two years ago when I did the Northwest Stages, Paul McKinnon was matching my times at the end of the rally and I was thinking, bloody hell. You know? <laughs> Fair play, but then yeah. people took. Well, he has got a thirty-four mil strip. So I was like, right, okay, it must. Um, did you not know that a... before then? Did you? Did you only no. find that out like during or after the rally? Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> you know, people say it, it is quite a decent advantage. Yeah, but you know, for me, I think it's a bit of a shame that we're all, not all just. It's all equal. Yeah. I actually think we should all be on a 34. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that'd sort the problem, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, I was wondering, like, what is the actual solution? But then I suppose just just all go to 34. And But then is that for the, like, the homologation or for, for the BRC, for the championship? Everyone's got to be under the homologation, which is the 32 mil restrictor. Exactly, yeah. Right. And it, it does make sense, really, doesn't it? Because you, you've got all the national championships over Europe. Yeah, with the same rules, so yeah, it's um, and it's such a good category, isn't it? Yeah, like I don't think there's ever been a, a category as good as Rally Two. Yeah, oh, the car's incredible. Like obviously, you see, now I had the pleasure of driving one, you know, last year, and I just to be honest, I found it really easy to drive. It just felt. It just felt brilliant. Now, obviously, I was in 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 the Fiesta, and the Fiestas are, you know, notoriously, uh, you know, a lot easier or one of the easier to get a hold of. More forgiving, shall we say, than the other ones. You know, the Polos maybe a bit more go karting, a bit aggressive. Um, yeah. But I I jumped in it and felt really at home in it, kind of straight away. Now I did a lot of simulator work and stuff, but what a car! It didn't yeah. actually. Do you know what? Because I didn't find it. In, in a straight line in the top speed, I was like, it's not actually that fast. But as soon as you jump on the brakes and you, yeah. and you throw the pair of into the into the bloody windscreen and then you throw it in and just plant it and it just goes. It's a, a you know cracking machinery, it really is. And actually, I did a podcast with um, David Bogey and we're talking about the differences between R5 and Rally 2. Now, obviously, you've, you've you know, driven both cars is there a huge leap up into the rally too now david bogey kind of said well unless you're really you know driving it proper you're probably not going to see too much of a difference but you know what what have you got to say about you know the differences between r5 and rally 2 and then the rally 2 itself i think it's a very it's just the very slightly upgraded but it's it, I don't think you'd feel the difference, to be honest. Right, okay. Like the Fabio R5, the original one, I mean, what a car that still is. Yeah. Like that car with a with a 34mm restrictor, you, you know, you could still well easily win any rally in the UK with that, for me. Really? Yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah, for, for me, okay, maybe the, the new Fiesta is a big step from the old one. Because there's several years difference. Yeah, but it's this R five is rally two, really, isn't it? It's just yeah, they're just all getting a little bit quicker, a little bit newer. Like yeah. the Polo's probably 
almost getting a bit old, isn't it? Because it's five <laughs> years old now compared to the Aris. Yeah. But, you know, it's still there, isn't it? So, yeah. Still an R5 see. car, the Polo. Do you know, I was looking on the EWC results and I was actually wondering that. I'm not quite in tune with all that, but, you know, is, so you say that is just the, the basic R5 car. That's not a Rally 2 upgrade. No, it's the same. It's, mate, it's the same. Yeah, it's um like Rally Two is um is just the name change, isn't it? Really, I yeah. think. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm missing something, but <laughs> <laughs> but I was gonna say to you on on when you jumped in the Fiesta, I think if you can drive a R two car, which is a um what we know is you know the front wheel drive R two. Yeah. N- now it, I think it's RC four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you can drive a front wheel drive car well, you can jump in an R five or Rally two, and it's easy. That's yeah. exactly how I felt with, you know, with you when I did my first rally and one. It was like, it was just easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, like front wheel drive is the best school. That's really good advice, actually. I have asked the other people that we've done podcasts with, like, what advice would you give to the youngsters and. <laughs> Some folk have said, if you've got the money, just bloody go for it. <laughs> Straight out yeah. of four wheel drive. And we kind of like uh, reference Cali Robin Perra, but then, you know, <laughs> he 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 was learning at a lot younger age than a lot of us. <laughs> he was he was yeah. rallying, you know, very, very early on or getting the seat time in. So, you know, I think by the time he got to stages the rest of us, he'd already had a few years under his belt. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, mate. Yeah, but it's um, it's a it's a funny one, that isn't it? Because you've got like Rove and Pear and Solberg who literally driving WRC cars age twelve, <laughs> and then and then you've got Loeb who started rallying at like our age. <laughs> yeah, it's so, mental, um, isn't it? It is good though, isn't it? Because. I don't think age should be a, it shouldn't be a thing really. No. It's a bit unfair that, like people were saying to me when I was 24 and I just won the ERC, oh, you're getting a bit old now. Really? It's like, it's it's just rubbish, isn't it? Yeah. It shouldn't really be a thing. Like you've still got mega quick drivers who are in the late 30s and whatever. Yeah. It bodes well for the likes of myself then. It means I can still do a bit of rallying. <laughs> 100%, mate. When when Loeb can win Monte Carlo age 49, <laughs> then, well, he is, he is an, a, a freak of nature though, isn't he? Yeah. I remember listening to Bex Williams commentating or, or saying something and she was like, and Sebastian Loeb was the only person to come back out of Park Fermi or back at wherever, wherever it was to go for a coffee at the coffee shop just up the road. And then there's a picture of him there with a coffee and the cigarette, just chilling. <laughs> yeah, what a legend. When I did, so we did a rally in France end of last year against yeah. him. And that was probably one of the highlights of my life. <laughs> just like spending a bit of time with him in between stages, just yeah. chatting and yeah, like the coolest guy ever. What's he was, like? Is he cool? Oh my god, he's mate the coolest guy ever. <laughs> and we we were buzzing when he would come over to us at the end of the stage and he would like ask us for our time. And then as he walked off, we were like <laughs> we, were, we were just so so excited and you know trying to play it cool in front of him, but Yeah. What a guy. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, it was, exciting. It was good fun that. Oh, good. I think I got into his head a bit actually on one before one stage. I said it's bloody um it's bloody cold today, Seb. I think I'm gonna go on softs. Yeah. And he actually went on softs and it was the wrong choice. We didn't <laughs> go on softs in the end. <laughs> and um we took a bit of time out of him. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that was good 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 memories. Oh, fantastic. Oh, do you know what? That's what I love about rallying. Like, obviously, you're rallying at the kind of top level, and you know you've just been, you know, doing some incredible stuff. But even as like a spectator or something, you know, you can 
you can rub shoulders with these people. You can go in the pub on the rally Sunday and you can have the crack with them. Right? It's just a great sport. You know, there's oh, just mate, that's so everyone well stayed stepped. humble. You can chat to anyone. Yeah, it's so true. It's so accessible, isn't it? Yeah. It like, you'd absolutely. never get that in Formula One, would you? No. No, not at all. Not without paying a fortune or being famous or something to get a grid walk or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's the best sport in the world. Yeah, oh, it absolutely is. Well, Chris, I won't keep you too much longer, pal. But like we say, um I would love to carry this conversation on and we'll talk a bit more about your rallying career, the ups and the downs and you know, the going well and a few of the crashes and we'll, We'll talk about the Twingo, <laughs> you know, we'll, uh, we'll cover a bit more stuff. So, um, yeah, I'll leave you to enjoy France. Um, yeah, Chris, you're, uh, thank you so much for your time. And a fantastic, a fantastic start to the, to the British Championship. Buzzing for it, yeah. Thanks so much, mate. And good to get to know you a bit better. Yeah. No, fantastic. Well, Chris, thanks very much, and we'll chat to you later on in the week, pal. Thanks, mate. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers, cheers.